Welcome everybody to yet another OpenShift Commons uh, briefing as we're want to do on Fridays. We're going to talk about some aspect of transformation, organizational or otherwise. Um, and today, uh, once again, one of my favorite guests, um, Jay Bloom is here with us from Red Hat's uh, Office of Global Transformation. And we're going to talk a little bit about something that sounds kind of highfalutin, but it's actually something um, we really, really all should know a little bit more about. Social practice theory and transformation in the context of technology. Um, and I'm going to let Jabe explain and talk about that for a while, and then we'll have live Q&A at, at the end. And uh, uh, probably, as always, hopefully, a wonderful conversation about the topic. So Jabe, take it away. Cool. Thank you. Um, so uh, if you guys want to tweet about this, I like tweeting uh, SPTX, so social practice transformation. Uh, I'm Saitain. If you guys want to find me, um, be happy to chat on the Twitters afterwards. Uh, really quickly, this uh, presentation has a lot of material from my dissertation. I'm getting a PhD. Uh, luckily for, for me, uh, part of my dissertation is working with people to help them understand these ideas. Uh, in fact, part of the requirement for my dissertation is that I show that I have um, shared the uh, materials with uh, practitioners and, and potentially changed their behaviors. So uh, please, uh, you know, this is material that I would love for you guys to use. However, uh, it's very important that I get attribution uh, for, for the PhD. Uh, we don't want any confusion about the source of the materials. Um, so, uh, you know, everybody should attribute everyone always because it's a good way of maintaining a uh, meaningful, purposeful community. Uh, but in this case, please uh, be, be, be careful with, uh, with the materials uh, if you use them. Uh, thank you. So, uh, I have the... Um, the presentation broken into two pieces, just um, theory as an explanation. So like, what is social practice theory? What does it explain? And then theory of change. So if we, if we accept the social practice theory, what would the theory of change be? How would we change this thing that we're pointed at? So for, first step is just social practice as a theory uh, uh, social practice as, as an explanation of something. What is it explaining? What is it pointing at? Uh, what can it help us understand better? So I'll start with a very convoluted quote and then we'll try to get simpler. So a practice is a routinized behavior. So it's something that you do routinely. It's not something novel or new, it's something that you do regularly. Um, and it consists of multiple elements that are kind of connected together. Uh, so it's not just um, an activity, right? So it's, it, it is an activity, but it's not just an activity. So it's not practice as in the thing you do, um, but it's also uh, a set of material things, objects and things like this that you use when you're doing the activities and a set of kind of knowing, right? A, a set of understanding um, and, and, and having a reason for doing the practice um, that is motivational and potentially um, has some emotional content to it. So there's uh, some, some, some interesting pieces here, right? Like uh, practice isn't just uh, sitting down and playing your violin in this frame. Fra practice includes the violin and the reason you're playing the violin and the knowledge you need to have in order to play the violin, all of those things are considered part of a practice in this frame. So a, a, simply, a simpler one uh, to kind of like make it easier to kind of grab onto. Um, a practice is a social phenomenon. So the thing that was missing from the last piece was this maybe a little bit more of a pointing at what, at social. So this isn't something, a, a social practice isn't something um, that an individual does without other people. Um, and I don't mean that other people have to be present for the practice to uh, happen, but the reason you're doing the practice, if it's a social practice, has it, it is because it has a social context and meaning that makes the practice purposeful. So uh, they're, 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 uh, they're social phenomena, and they're a performance, right? They're, 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 uh, that, that's the way in which it's social. It's, you're performing for other people in some way uh, with expectations and things like this, right? Uh, the same way you can think of being on stage, you're performing, yeah? 
Um, and then there, there's, uh, it entails the reproduction. So the, there's this idea that cultural meaning and skill and tools here, all, all those things need to be constantly reproduced, recreated. So practice is the reproduction of those meanings, skills, and tools, yeah? Um, and the skills are learned in a social context, so you have to learn them um, from others, yeah? Um, and then there's common tools, technology, and products uh, where the common points, again, to shared, right? Like that, the, that they're not your private tools necessarily, they're common tools, um, they're shared tools. Um, and, and we'll talk about a little bit about the way in which all of this has a lot of wiggle in it um, uh, in a second. But but just to give you an idea, right, uh, we're, we're talking about kind of three big I, big pieces here. We're talking about meanings, skills, and materials, yeah? And so Shove uh, kind of says this is what a practice is made up of. And this is called the three elements model. Um, and she says that a practice is the kind of interconnection between materials, meanings, and skills or competencies, yeah? And so you can think about it this way. Uh, when you perform a practice, what you're doing is using your competence uh, with manipulating material things in order to create meaning, yeah? Uh, where meaning, again, could have a social aspect to it, where the meaning is something that you learn from other people. Um, and the, the materials uh, are not you know, necessarily just um, physical objects. They could be anything that, has, that matters. Uh, so it could be policies, things that, that, are, that are sticky and don't change easily. Yeah? And then skill, again, is, is your ability to uh, perform, your, your competency. And, and, you know, pointing at that competency, it's really um, the, the ability to do something where when the social group that you're interacting with, when they look at it, they judge you to be competent. In other words, they, they, they think that you did a good job uh, ma manipulating the materials in order to achieve the meaning that they expect, yeah? So, like a, a, a practical example, a lot of uh, social practice theory is, uh, frankly, from, from work that people are doing on sustainability, and so there's a lot of anal social practice analysis of um, practices, social practices that have, um, that are unsustainable, or in their current shape are un unsustainable. Uh, and so this one is drying your clothes, right, and or laundering. Um, and, and so what you can see here is that it's not just one material, one procedure, or one meaning. It's it's a set of them that are interacting, right? Um, and, and you can see see like obviously there's all sorts of different types of materials that are involved um, in. Uh, in reproducing lawn, line, line drying, right? Um, and then there's uh, frameworks and procedures and competencies and like time, right? All of those things uh, down at the bottom that, that, that tell you when it's appropriate to do things, what time you should do it, what type the conditions should be, um, what, what the laws are, all those things, right? So, uh, procedure or skill has to do with negotiating all of those uh, particular aspects. And then finally, meaning, right, is, is why do we launder? Like, what's the why of laundering, in a way? And, and so what we get is this idea of, like, di in different cultures, these meanings have, could be different, yeah? So you, you could say that, like, laundry is uh, it's clutter, it's on your floor, uh, you need to smell good in public. Uh, you need clean clothes. It's a sign of status to have clean clothes. All, all of these ideas have are why we launder, right? Uh, we launder for these reasons, um, and the skills that we use to interact with the materials allow us to achieve those meanings. And part of like the important piece to notice here is that we can swap bits and pieces out 
of a practice and still have the same practice. So line drawing could be done in different cultures for different meaning, or could be done with different materials, or could require different skills because of, for instance, different regulatory frameworks or different expectations of time. Um, so there's this kind of wiggliness to it where a, a, a practice is identifiable uh, because it involves similar things, but it doesn't have to be explicitly the exact practice. So, you know, one way of saying that is like uh, uh, social practice is not best practice, right? Like best practice would be highly, highly defined what all of these things would be. Um, on the other hand, best practice can be a social practice. Uh, so you, you could um, you could use best practice as a way of reinforcing and creating a social practice. Um, maybe it would be brittle, but we can have other conversations about that. Um, so an individual's behavior then um, is a performance of a social practice, right? So again, it's the ability to negotiate those various constraints. Um, and also like, I, I like to use jazz for this, right? Like um, there's a materiality to jazz, your instrument, the other people involved, a club, things like that. Um, there is the skill, uh, including knowledge of, of arcane scales and and, uh, and the way of Im improvising and things like this. And then there's different meanings that people uh, create from jazz, of course. Um, so, uh, but the important part of it is not just the idea that jazz is a social practice, but that social practice is a lot like jazz because it's almost always improvisational. Um, the idea of being competent with materials to create meaning, uh, part of the, the competency is the ability to reproduce the practice even though the material or meaning might change, right? So that's why you have competency is because if you were given the exact same things uh, in the exact same condition over and over again, uh, you would, you, you'd still have some competency in theory but it wouldn't be particularly challenging. Uh, and uh, you know, nobody would uh, particularly be interested in watching you do something exactly the same way over and over again. The, the interesting part about jazz and music and things like that is the, the way in which the context, the, the particular audience, the particular club, the particular group uh, interpret uh, the music uh, and therefore the performance, like the performance of the social practice, is contextual and it's bound to the particular materiality and meaning of the time and space that it is uh, uh, kind of enacted. Yeah. So um, the important part is to think about this: that stability and routinization are not the endpoints of uh, of normalization. Rather, they should be understanding as ongoing accomplishments in which similar, not not the exact same, similar elements are repeated and linked together in similar ways. So again, uh, a social practice doesn't have this idea of narrowing to a specificity. It has this idea of um, the, the loosely coupled relationship between these three ideas, um, uh, uh, these three kind of components, and the way in which those things come together uh, creates a closure uh, that allows the performance of the of the um, of the performance um, uh, of the practice. Sorry, uh, I, I like to talk about it. I have a friend, Mark, Ber Mark Bergauer, and I, when I talk about it with him, one of the things I, we talk about is kind of fried eggs or um, scrambled eggs. And uh, Mark uh, lives in in Edinburgh and uh, or outside Edinburgh um, and. Uh, he, he flew over uh, one year and stayed with me. And I said to him, like, do you want to have scrambled eggs in, in the morning? And he said, sure. And so I made uh, uh, scrambled eggs the way that I was taught. So again, that points to that like social learning part of, of um, uh, <laughs> social practice. Um, and so I, I made something that I call, that are called scramble fried eggs, right? So. Uh, you basically fry the egg a little bit and then you scramble it. Yeah, um, and, and you know, 
I used a pan, I used a spatula, I used a bowl, I used eggs, I used a stove, you know, all these things. Um, but Mark, when he was watching me, uh, observed, uh, that's not how I make scrambled eggs. Uh, the interesting part about it is, to me, is that he still recognized that it was making of scrambled eggs um, in, in that the meaning of the meal was being closed still. So, like, it was a different set of materials, a little bit uh, different, as in, like, it wasn't on his stove, but it was very similar, um, uh, similar ingredients, things like that, but it was a different skill. So I had mutated the skill in a way that he didn't recognize, uh, but I was still using the same materials to achieve the same meaning, yeah? So there's this wiggliness about uh, uh, it that allows it to be recreated and re-performed. I, I think of it sometimes like it, they're, they're like heuristics for the relationship between the three. Um, and that, that in the way that you don't necessarily always have to have explicit rules for, for heuristic to work, you don't have to have specific materials, meanings, or skills. You just have to have a relationship that makes it appear similar. Um, I, I, by the way, went and stayed with Mark, and he makes uh, like a French-style uh, scrambled eggs, like very, uh, I, I guess I, I think of you in my head as European, they're very wet and loose. Um, and, and we had a great conversation about how he was literally using the same things with a different set of skills, low heat, uh, long period of time, um, constant movement, very different than the way the skills that I deploy to make the scrambled eggs. But then we sat down and had a meal together and enjoyed the eggs that we had made. Same meaning, same outcome. Uh, and then we also, you know, had to wash the dishes and all the other social practices that go along with making eggs. And many of those were very similar, right? They, they, we, we performed those the same way. So one of the things to think about uh, when you think about social practice is um, that you're often not explicitly taught a social practice. You're just kind of like you watch other people in a social context and learn how to do it. Um, and the result of that is um, that often um, when we talk about things, we talk about practices, social practices, uh, we don't really recognize that other people might do what we're saying in a different way. They might implement the practice or perform the practice differently than we do. Um, and so you get weird things, right? Like uh, different people do TDD differently, but it's for the same purpose, yeah? Uh, and one of the ways that you can kind of generally judge that someone's competent is if they're doing TDD for the right reasons as opposed to doing it with a specific tool set or doing it uh, with a specific process, yeah? Um, instead, it's more about does the way they interact with those things achieve the meaning uh, behind uh, test-driven development uh, is, is one way of thinking that. So anyway, um, so there's something else in here about uh, social practice that's kind of important. And since we're talking about transformation and technology and, and work transformation, uh, you know, one of the important things is kind of, kind of structure it in a work environment. And, and one of the questions is like, what does an, a, an account of a good work day entail, right? Like, how, how do you know that you had a good day at work? Um, and, and I think there's this, you know, I, hopefully a lot of you have seen this before, I will not be able to say his name correctly, Czech Mahay Mahele, um, his, his theory of flow, and the, the, on, the, on the left is the one that most people see the most commonly, and on the right is a more complicated version of it. But the idea of it is this, that there's things that you have an opportunity to do, and then there's capabilities. And of course, like one of the things I'm gonna point out here is that that, is, that capability is the same type of capability that we're talking about in a, in, a, um, in, a, in a social practice context, right? It's the ability or the skill to do something. And so opportunities and challenges in the social practice theory come from um, changes in materiality and changes in meaning, yeah? So the, the reason why those things change um, is, is, is kind of orthogonal, it's not, not important for right now, but those are the things that change and therefore give you opportunities and therefore give you challenges, yeah? And 
in your your capabilities grow, your ability to perform in different contexts in a way that people see you as being competent, those grow, right? And so you can see that uh, in the model, there's this like tic-tacking idea where a flow state or where a good day at work means that you've kind of moved through a process by which things have changed without tipping you too far into anxiety and without staying so similar that you become bored. There's like a tic-tacking process up there. And, and I think the, the, the model on the right gives you a subtly different version of those things where um, the, the relationship between flow and skills and challenges becomes a little bit richer. So it's not just that you can be bored. It's that, in fact, you could have high sets of skills that ha are, have low challenge and give you great relaxation. And you could have medium amounts of challenge and still feel in control. Uh, both of those being not necessarily in that perfectly good day at work feeling, uh, but in ways that uh, allow you to feel like you are in control. On the, on the other side of it, of course, is when your uh, adaptive capacity, your ability to uh, perform uh, your, your, the needed skills in order to close the um, practice in a way that is recognized by others as being competent, that when you're incapable of doing that, you start kind of moving from being aroused or aware of your inabilities to being anxious, to literally not uh, being worried about maybe being caught or not being able, not being seen as being competent. Um, and, and extensive amounts of this can cause you to worry. And, you know, it's a nice uh, way of thinking through kind of the emotional interactions that one has in an everyday context um, at work. Uh, and the way in which uh, social practice uh, is, is the everyday experience at work where one is in a flow state, where one believes that they're performing in a way that is socially um, accepted, socially um, uh, socially meaningful, yeah. So to be to be competent is an evaluation of the ability to create the closure of the constraints that arise from the interactions between material conditions, social meaning, and action. So what I mean by the constraints that arise from is just when the material conditions change, when the social meaning changes when you're asked to do things in a different way, new policies, et cetera, like that, those create um, constraints. Those, those, make, um, those force you to change your behavior. Um, and to create closure means to change your behavior in a way where you can realign these three things again and therefore continue to produce the practice in a way that's con considered competent uh, in, in your social system. Yeah. So. Uh, one other thing about social practice theory, I think there's only one other thing, I, I might have more, but um, social practice theory also isn't just one practice at a time. And this again points a little bit towards this um, idea of being competent. Um, and what, it, what I mean by being competent in this kind of uh, frame is that uh, teams and people um, and and uh, interactions between teams, interactions between or even organizations rely on kind of interpredictability. That means that uh, I, I should have some expectation about what you're about to do um, in relationship to whatever we're working on together. And you, uh, if you uh, perform to my expectations, uh, within reason, like from what I observe or what I think is important, um, then uh, I, I will think that you're predictable. I can I can modify my behavior based on what I expect your behavior to be. Um, doesn't always necessarily have to be positive behavior. Uh, maybe the interpredictability is that you'll do something poorly, but as long as I can kind of predict what's going to happen, I can coordinate behavior between uh, different organizations and different individuals. Yeah. Um, and, and of course, this points at this idea, again, of the way in which attitudes and actions, so that's that, again, that 
collection of meanings and skillful coping, create common ground, uh, meaning, uh, knowledge, beliefs, and assumptions um, in order to create this kind of uh, facilitated coordinative action, right? So one way of thinking about this is that um, that social practices create the, uh, the stability for a social system to evolve out of it. Uh, so one of the ways you could think about this is like cultural expectations are built on these same structures, right? The, that you will do certain things in certain, at certain times of the day uh, with certain types of materials. And if I see you doing those things at certain times of the day with those certain types of materials and you produce some outcome that I can look at, I will think, yeah, you, you're pretty predictable and that's great. I don't have to pay a lot of attention to you uh, because you seem competent. On the other hand, if you do things at the wrong time of day, according to my viewpoint, uh, or with the wrong materials, or uh, with the wrong process, uh, or you produce something that I don't expect, uh, we kind of reduce the social network um, or, or challenge the social network. Uh, and that's, that's important to kind of think through when we think about social practice. So again, another wall of text uh, from, from Chotsky. Um, but but important uh, part of this is that it's not just like a social system that's net, net, networked together with social practices. It's actual practices that get networked together. So uh, again, I pointed at uh, when we talk about frying eggs, like frying eggs, um, cleaning dishes, um, eating a meal, uh, setting the table, all of those social practices are kind of like a network of practices that are interrelated around common themes or meanings and uh, skills and materials, right? Um, and so there's three ways that Shotsky says that these things kind of interact with each other. Um, they either interact through understandings. Um, so they, these are, again, I think what we would call expectations of, of what people should know. Um, or that common ground that we pointed at earlier, through explicit rules, principles, and instructions. So literally, uh, the practices hold together by people creating rules to define how they interact with each other. And then finally, through what he calls teleoffective structures. And teleoffective structures, uh, teleoffective means future feelings, yeah? Um, so things, our expectations, are things that we think should happen, and how the practices should relate together to achieve tasks, purposes, projects, ends, goals, things like that. So the network is stabilized by these three, three, these three types of things. The network of practices is stabilized by these three types of things. So what you can think of when you think of a nexus of practices is that you might have one practice and there's some stabilizing factors on that practice and some destabilizing practice. Um, Factors on that practice. So the stabilizing practices are the things we, uh, sorry, the stabilizing factors are the things we, we just pointed at: understandings, policies, teleoffective structures, expectations, things like that. Um, and that stabilizes the practice. The the expectations of what a good performance of the practice would look like are are structured by those things and and stabilized by those things. Now there's destabilizing, where you could think of them as challenging. Uh, parts of, of uh, things to a practice. And those would include things like the environment changes or the materiality of the system changes. Um, other associated practices change because of some environmental change or material change. And then changes in those teleoffective structures or changes in expectations that cause um, the social network or the social practice network to start discohering from itself, kind of coming apart. Yeah? And the other thing is that you have these kind of interesting relations, right? That the, the, the practices are related to each other. Yeah, they might share material, they might share meaning, they might share policy um, or procedure or skill. Um, and the sharedness of them makes them into this kind of fabric or network of um, of uh, of of practices. Maybe one might call it a complex of practices. Um, 
The final thing uh, to point out really quickly here is that all practices, again, produce outputs. So they, they reconfigure, change, modify a material condition in a way that achieves or does not achieve an outcome, yeah? Um, so the kind of back and forth there is the recognition that practices change materials, the, uh, the material conditions, A, and B, the change in material conditions is going to be judged by some social system, that's the whether or not you're competent or not, and then the feedback from the social system um, about the output and outcome modify the practice itself as well. So we've got a, a couple different ways of like thinking through kind of practice as an individual practice, as a network of practice, as something that's stabilized and destabilized. So the implications here though um, are Im important, right? The implication is that the focus is what we want to focus on. So the focus is what we want to focus on. Um, the focus of the analysis uh, that we want to do when we're thinking about transformation is going to move from individuals to shared behaviors. Yeah, uh, we're we're not going to analyze what an individual is doing. We're going to analyze the material conditions, the competencies, and the uh, meanings um, of of a particular practice to determine uh, how it's stabilized, how it's recreated, how it's reproduced. And then if we want to change it, we're also going to look at those things and ask how to change those things, not as specifically how to change it, the individual involved. So um, why is that? There's this weird uh, version of it that we need to kind of point out really quickly. Um, we're trying to get this weird balance um, between two different kind of theories. Uh, we, we, we are trying to avoid with social practice, we're trying to avoid a completely atomistic theory. Uh, what I mean by that is the idea that each individual in an organization is completely autonomous, um, can act however they want, um, can can access kind of atemporal, non-contextual logic that will drive their behavior, um, and you know that is represented by kind of homo economicus, this kind of theory that there's a rational decision maker involved. Um, so social practice doubts that, right? Social practice is suggesting that that individual doesn't is is doesn't really exist, can't really exist because it doesn't explain any of the normative expectations that a independent person would have. How do they get the normative models, how do they understand what's desirable and not desirable, how do they model their needs, all those things seem to be not explained well by somebody who's completely rational. So, you know, again, uh, a completely rational individual could be completely modeled in a computer and therefore would not have any needs, it would simply be calculative. Um, on the other hand, we've got this, this thing that we're trying to avoid, right, which is this behaviorist theory of involuntary action, where the individual seems to be being controlled completely by the environment, right? That the only thing that we're seeing um, is the, um, the outcome of a kind of um, calculation by an organism uh, in relationship specifically to an environment, yeah? So that the behaviorist model also kind of like vacates the space in which a person performs because there is no performance, there's simply uh, a reaction to the environment. Yeah? So it's involuntary action kind of versus uh, independent action. And what we're trying to end up at is this idea that we have this embedded action where environment and context and historicity and time become important to how the individual interacts with uh, the environment himself herself and the social system that they're in. So we're trying to like avoid those two extremes and get to this middle thing where we have um, environmental influence, the influence of logic, but more normative logics than absolute logics. Um, and we want to end up in this kind of middle, middle spot. Um, all right, so uh, that's social practice theory really quickly. Now, now let's talk about like a theory of change for transforming social practices. So instead of talking about social practices directly, we want to talk about how do we change social practices, yeah? Um, so the, the first thing to point out is like 
there's this idea um, that uh, transformation can be an event, that it can happen like uh, I, I call it the big switch theory. Like we just pull a switch and, and the, the transformation occurs. Um, and all the things that we've just pointed at point to the idea that that can't be true. And also that you can't simply change what's in people's heads and ex expect um, the transformation to occur, right? Because what you should be able to see is behavioral change um, in a way that what you would think of as your habit, so the way, the way that you work every day at work, the flow state that you get into will be made up of different practices or will be made up of newly configured practices that have new material meanings, et cetera. Yeah? So transformation uh, is not going to be this kind of uh, switch that we turn on. It's going to be the mutation of uh, individual practices and the network of practices that we've been talking about. So one of the principal implications of the theory of practice is that the sources of behavior change lie in the development of and the relation between the practices themselves. So in other words, behavior change um, from a social practice lens doesn't occur in the individual. It occurs in the modification of the social norms, the materials, and the competencies of a social network, not an individual. Yeah? Um, and therefore, the practices of the locality of change, not the individuals involved which is not to say that individuals don't perform those things, but it's just to say that's not the unit of analysis that we're looking at. So this is a crazy slide to try to talk through kind of three different places in which you might think of intervening if you were doing a social practice-based transformation. And so the first one might be to reconfigure the network of practices. So you might determine what practices you want. Um, for instance, you might determine... Um, that you want to do um, CICD, and in order to do CICD, you decide that you also need to have better test-driven development um, and uh, a better um, uh, source code control evaluation and a little bit more um, kind of uh, um, peer evaluation of uh, written work and things like this. So the, those end up being a network of practices that you want to reconfigure. You want to change the configuration of the practices in order to enable that CICD uh, continuous deployment style. Yeah? So you have this network of things that you want to change and you want to reconfigure and you want to be conscious about the relationships between those things and how they might work, right? Um, I think um, when, when you think through that kind of theory, uh, the reconfiguration of a network of practices. I, I like um, to talk a, about, um, uh, uh, my brain is not going to produce the thing that I want to say right now, a maturity mapping, yeah. So uh, maturity mapping, uh, which you can look up online really quickly, is, is focuses on that particular type of change, yeah. Uh, you, you might want to reconfigure the practice itself. So that might mean... Uh, uh, you currently have um, your ticket system is currently JIRA and you want to move to Rally, uh, which means you're going to change the materiality of the system while trying to preserve the skill and meaning of the system. So you might reconfigure the practice to new materials, you might reconfigure the practice to new sets of skills with the same materials, things like that. And you also might replace a practice. So you might uh, try to eliminate a practice and uh, uh, re uh, populate the space in which uh, it was with a new practice. So you might want to move from Gantt charts to Kanban boards. Um, and one of the ways to think about that is that uh, if you don't remove the materiality of the Gantt chart, like the little literally physical object of it being around, uh, and replace it with the physical materiality of a Kanban board, the likelihood of people drifting back to the skills and meanings that they associate with the, and already know how to perform competently, with the Gantt chart means that the adoption of the Kanban board is highly unlikely because that will require that they be challenged and move into those anxious states that require actual modification of skill and potential uh, performance of, uh, incompetent performance of uh, of the skill it required to, to adopt the new material to close the current set of meanings, right? Um, so 
when we think about kind of the ways that those might happen, we could think about the idea that the relationships between things can be undesigned. Uh, the materials could be undesigned. In other words, removed from the system. You could redesign the materials and the interactions, as in reconfigure them, uh, modify them, kind of do you know any sort of Kaizen or Kaikaku style of change there. Um, but that is the improvement or the additional, like design as adding, additive, progressive, uh, as opposed to undesigned, removing. Um, and then when we look at no, uh, meanings, we could like denormalize something. We could say we used to believe that, we don't believe that anymore. Or we could renormalize something by adopting a new practice and trying to change the way people think about the current set of meanings that renormalize around a new set of meanings. And finally, like skills, um, which I think frankly, are the primary interaction point for most transformations, like the idea that we need to modify skills is, is a significant one. Um, this, we could automate the skill, uh, therefore making the practice uh, lighter, or we could develop the skill, right? So th this is not meant to be comprehensive, complete, it's just suggestions at places to kind of look at the way that this might change, yeah? Um, so, one of the things to kind of think through here, um, again, is uh, are there are there other people who've tried to kind of think through transformation like this? And, and Shook has this this model that he uses to describe how things worked at Numi. And one of the things that he points out is that like the the traditional transformation or change model starts with the idea that you need to change the culture, and then it will change the values and then it'll change what actually happens, what people actually do. And in Shine's version of it, which is, is, is similar, um, and where the pyramid, frankly, comes from in the first place, uh, you have, uh, you know, what, what we need to do is change the assumptions, and then we can change the values, and then we can change the artifacts or the outputs um, of the system, yeah? And for Shook and Shine, what they both eventually arrive at is the idea that you can't start from the bottom of the pyramid, you have to start from the top of the pyramid. So I think the interesting thing is that um, social practice would say that, that uh, neither one is wrong, but neither one is complete, yeah? Because what we do and the artifacts are related in a social practice, and how they relate actually creates the things lower on, on their pyramids, right? So this schism between the two is problematic from a social practice point of view because it says, yes, you do need to start with uh, competency, what we do, and you do need to start with uh, artifacts, uh, materials, it, and then you can maybe modify meaning, but, um, but it misses that, uh, I think. So, Part of that, I think, is because of the way that people make their work lives meaningful. Um, and so uh, this is called the hermeneutic, hermeneutic loop. And uh, the really simple way of saying this is, is just you have a worldview. You have an idea of what the world's like, the whole world, um, your whole world. Everyone has a different world, by the way. That's a whole other conversation. But in a way, uh, that, that worldview describes what is meaningful. Yeah, and it also describes what you should pay attention to and what intentions you should have about the world, right? And the result of that is that it drives through your skillful interaction with the world and experience of the materiality of the world. Um, and when we loop those things together, what we get is a constantly reproducing system where your experiences in the world inform your worldview and your worldview informs your experience of the world, yeah? And the interaction between these two things, uh, these three things, and between these two polarities, the part and the whole, um, are what uh, create, I think, a, um, an experience of uh, having a sense of history, a sense of identity, a sense of being skillful and being talented at work. Um, and so, uh, modifying any of these things requires modifying uh, or, or incrementing against all of them. Um, and again, to me at least, uh, the, the most important intervention point is in actual experience. So it, down at the bottom here, um, and as opposed to 
uh, trying to change the meaning at first because changing the whole just means that the one's experience of the world becomes completely discontiguous. It becomes, a, you, you, you don't understand how to experience the world anymore because all the meanings that you used to have that were related to your skills, the materials that you're used to become meaningless and therefore you have no skill to interact with the materiality of the world anymore. So, um, one last point, um, and then we can chat as much as you guys like. Uh, when we think about kind of organizations as open systems, one of the things we can think about is that uh, they, they become more and more complex. They become more and more heterogeneous internally. In other words, uh, they're, there's more and more skill, uh, there's more and more social practices involved, the social practices mutate and change a little bit, and therefore that network of social practices becomes more complex, but also the network of social practices becomes stable. So that uh, if, you, <laughs> if you're in an organization that's not stable, that quote unquote does not work, then it will not uh, last for a long time. So in any organization that you're in that's been around for any extended period of time, uh, despite your beliefs that it may or may not be um, you know, a, a group of incompetent people who don't know what they're doing and or that there's no way it could possibly survive, if it's surviving, then it, it, it is at a steady state. It is a, it is a network of relationships of social practices that uh, reproduces itself every day when you show up at work. Um, so, uh, one of the things to say about that kind of network of social practices and one of the things we might think about is that what we end up having is more and more these kind of bubbles where it says inside, these are these bubbles of practice, and that inside each bubble of practice is a set of social practices that are meaningful inside that, that um, that bubble, but may or may not be meaningful to other parts of the organization inside their bubbles. Um, however, because of the network of social practices, some of those social practices end up being in the in-betweens. They end up being shared social practices. So these I call boundary practices, and they're the practices, the social practices that bind together multiple social groups in a way where their interdependency and their interpredictability becomes useful and stabilizes the system, right? So what we should expect in any organization is to be able to find uh, a set of practices that are meaningful to a certain social group and a set of practices that are meaning to, meaningful between any uh, number of other social groups. So, you know, we can talk about this uh, quickly, but the idea here is that you know devs and ops, just as an example, create a boundary. Uh, they have a, a place in which they negotiate uh, practice together, and that negotiation of practice is what causes the closure of the social network and causes a kind of interweaving of the social practices across the um, two groups in a way that they can both achieve the meaning that's meaningful to them and their social group, meaning meaningful to the developers, meaning meaningful to the operators, but also that they share whatever meanings are required to create a social practice that uh, allows for these things to occur. And that's what we might call a boundary. And so what we're looking for in a lot of cases in minimal viable boundary definitions, a way of creating these shared social practices and this, I think, uh, requires a concept of a social spanning role or a social spanning system uh, where the internal complexity of the system gets to a point where someone needs to be actively engaged in identifying these social practices that are shared and helping the uh, individuals uh, and teams involved with those shared social practices actually negotiate the way in which they evaluate the competent performance of those practices in order to increase the interpredictability of the system and therefore increase the resilience of the system and the performance of the system. So when we talk about transformation, uh, we want to be able to uh, identify, establish, and maintain, maintain and remove boundaries. Again, all of those boundaries, I think, are made up of social practices. And in relationship to this ability to transition is a process by which boundaries in organizations 
how those boundaries are decided, who lives in those boundaries, what the implications of them are, the ability to do those, discover those uh, boundaries, and make sense of them is what enables a transition uh, from one form to another, therefore enabling a transformation. I talked a lot. Thank you for listening. Wow. Okay. Wow. I think I had an epiphany a minute, and that was how many minutes? That was 35 minutes. That's a lot of epiphanies, Jabe. So um, thank you very much for today. And uh, I'm going to unmute a few other people, too, um, at, you know, some of the usual players and, and let them chime in as well. But one of, like, just even going back to the very beginning of this uh, whole conversation, uh, the, the laundry diagram, all right, like, so the first one, and, like, thinking about practices and, and breaking them down in that way. Um, and, you know, I know we're the Global Transformation Office and, and um, Little Idea, a.k.a. Andrew, uh, Clay Schaefer, you know, and everybody is all about DevOps, or John Willis is all about DevSecOps. Well, I'm all about uh, community development and maybe yep. maybe community development ops, right, and yep. the toolings. But it really um, illustrated for me, you know, the different pieces of a practice very nicely. So um, I and what popped into my head immediately when you put the laundry thing up was code contributions. Oh. You know, the practice of you know, hanging, especially hanging out laundry to dry, the simple task of that, you can put up a line between two trees, have a couple pegs, not even pegs, just throw it over a line, and you could be able to do code, con you know, dry your laundry. But the complexity of something like making a code contribution to an open source project um, and all of the pieces and parts that go into that. And I know there's, there's a lot of people on the call, too, that are probably having their minds blown right now, but um, the... The way, and I think DevOps is a great example of um, the coming together of trying to transform some social practices within technology um, com organizations. Yep. Um, I know in my little way what I'm trying to do is transform um, community development practices yep. from some, arc, you know, what I consider archaic, static ar art forms, uh, doing it by your gut, to using some real... Um, practical, data-driven, you've seen the del the jellyfish diagram, you know, but it's also, it's really very, I, you think you very succinctly broke down um, some of the problems that I have, because I think if I show people these tools, they're just going to use them, right? Um, and it, it's just it's just not that. Or if the other thing that popped into my brain at one point was, I always try and model the behavior I want to see in other people. Yep. Um, and that's sort of the atomist, atomic, atomatist, mm -hmm. atomists, whatever that, yeah, that, that word, it's not atomic. Um, it's, I don't, and, and I go atomic atomistic. when people <laughs> don't, don't adopt the thing that I want. And yeah. you've really given us, I think, a very nice way to see how to, how everything breaks down um, in, in practical ways, not breaks down as in fails, but how to break down when you want to affect change. So, um, I'm going to have to watch this like five times until I get everything out of it. But yeah. it, it was pretty, pretty amazing to me, I think. Um, and the and the concept and maybe if you could talk a little bit more about the boundary practices, because sure. what what I look at and, and I know I've shared with you the jellyfish network analysis stuff is what I've been trying to do is make that piece that overlaps you know it's interesting to account and sales managers where everybody's playing and which projects and it's interesting to community development people because then they can know who's in their community and it's useful to product development folks because they can see where they have and like i in my little head and i'm sure i'm just you know i feel ego egotistical about it but i think i found the little thing that overlaps all of these different things and trying now to show each of them the usefulness to bring them together to change the way we look at community development. Um, and I wish that we could be so successful doing that as um, we've done with uh, DevOps and other practices too, and, and maybe that would do it. So I'll um, yeah. zip and see if anybody else wants to chime in too, because I know maybe it's not just my mind that's been blown, but um, a few other folks as well. So. 
and as I pop into everybody else's little world here, um, I know there are a couple of folks that have done that, and I didn't see any actual questions, but Mike and Barbara, if, if you want to add in anything there, um, and I see Diego's there as well. Hi, Mike. How are you? You get microphones working and all of that. But I, I really think that one of the, and I'll keep talking if nobody else is going to, Jay, because you've, um, you've really kind of hit on a lot of things. I have so many notes here, too. But um, the idea that we can create best practices and codify them and write them down and share them with the other, but transforming them over into social practices was another thing. And um, I, that I really kind of is, is inspiring me to think about how to, to leverage that, yep. you know, better. I think, you know, I think when we think about a couple of things, one of the things is like always try to like think about it as a network. And then one of the things you try to do is like try to figure out what practices sh share the same materials. And then you can like think, oh, if I change this material, here's the network of practices that will change around it, right? Same thing with meaning, like what, what skills and practices are involved in creating this kind of meaning? Um, and I, you know, I, I use all sorts of weird versions of this to kind of explain to somebody, but like uh, I, I have a friend uh, in my PhD program who comes from Pakistan uh, and he, he said the first time he kind of came to the United States, he couldn't understand toilets. Uh, they didn't make any sense because he looked at them and he said, you know, the 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 rim of the toilet uh, kind of looks like you could stand on it, but that's not anything that he'd ever seen before. And his point being, of course, uh, he he used squat potties, right? Like so, you stand over the the, the trench pot, uh, uh, toilet. Uh, so you're supposed to stand while pooping. They're not supposed to sit. Um, and so he was trying to negotiate how to do this. And of course, like again. Cleanliness uh, was important in both cultures, but in his culture, you clean yourself with water, and it's actually part of kind of a, it has religious connotations and, and all sorts of things. Uh, and and you don't use toilet paper, right? So you, you like walk into a bathroom to perform defecation, which seems like something that everybody should be able to do, but the material configuration does not allow you to achieve the meaning that you think is important in the world. And so like understanding how those things kind of interact to enable or disable people's ability to achieve their goals is an important part of understanding like when you change the infrastructure in an organization, when you when you go in and try to change the what is meaningful for an organization, when you go in and change, try to insist that people need to adopt new skills without changing the meaning or the materiality of the of the organization, all those types of transformations are almost certainly going to fail because the network of meaning and skill and materiality, the network is stable and will remain stable until someone actually intervenes in these multiple ways as opposed to focusing on one particular way. So the, the other thing that, um, well, there's so many things, like I said, one a minute. Um, at least. And one of them, the things that you talked about was the interpredictability. Um, and and when, we, when I think about that in terms of team building or like building teams across multiple um, silos within Red Hat or something like that. And the, I think the phrase you used was um, that joint activity assumes a basic compact um, to facilitate coordinated action. And how many times we don't have that basic contact, com compact? Like at Red Hat, we have um, the Open Organization Compact, right, um, which we assume everybody believes in and, and does. But even within silos, we have different um, basic compacts. So, you know, and, and I think that one of the key things in transforming organizations is, is teasing out what those basic compacts are yep. and our assumptions about them. You know, we, you know, because like, Things like we have, like how people are metriced. Um, we are, I think, we're just achieving now um, 
we don't have open metrics. Like I don't know what, what someone else in another organization or business unit is being metriced on, or maybe we do, but I haven't figured out how to get to the Mojo page where it's hidden. So, you know, I, and on a daily basis, I don't know. But so the, all of the things that affect our basic compacts within an, org, an enterprise organization or re, within a community of developers working on an open source project, there are so many assumptions that are left unsaid or undiscussed. Yep. And I'm wondering, I know with DevOps, we created this whole sort of culture of explaining what DevOps is and teaching it and all of that sort of stuff. But um, how you get people to tease out what that basic compact is everybody has together. So, I mean, I think a couple of things. One, I, like one of the things I always like to say about DevOps kind of early in the conversation is that I don't think DevOps is a culture. I think it's a way of changing a culture. Um, and, and what I mean by that is this. I think good DevOps makes better developers by letting developers understand how their code works in operation. Mm -hmm. That makes better operators by letting operators understand how developers create code. Yeah, and I, like it's not trying to create more developers who can operate their stuff, which I think is a is like that's the no ops Listen. theory, yeah. and I think it's it's a miss. And I also don't think it's about making operators into developers, although I do think it is definitely about making operators understand how to apply software practice to operations. The different different thing, but I think so there's is, always yeah. Go ahead. So is DevOps the basic compact? Right, that is the thing that we're sharing across all of these different yeah. um, user types of persona, user personas yeah. within organizations. So coming yeah. to, uh, it, it may not be a culture, but it's a practice. That's um, right, it is a practice, it's a set of practices. And to me, again, the transformation activity, if you wanna do DevOps, is to sit down with the development and operations team and figure out what they share you don't want to trans. You don't want to homogenize the organization. You don't want to say all the developers have to be operators now, all the operators have to be developers now. You have to know. You have to have the complete understanding of either side's activities and uh, knowledges. Right. That's not what we're trying to achieve. What we're trying to achieve is we're going to say there's certain things, there's certain materials you share, there's certain skills that you have to perform together in order to achieve meaningful outcomes. If we can identify those things and focus our DevOps transformation on those things without like trying to change the whole way everybody works, we're, we're gonna be much more successful because it's gonna focus on those defining of boundaries. So again, part of the weird thing that I was pointing at when I pointed at the boundary formation in, in DevOps is to say, literally, DevOps is not about removing boundaries. It's about creating a boundary that can be negotiated. That's what DevOps is. And that, mm -hmm. that, that shared compact is the negotiation of an agreement about meaning, skill, and materials. Yeah? That's, what the, that's what the compact is. It's the negotiation of that. And to the extent that teams learn to negotiate their own compacts, you keep the, you keep the, the, the system kind of fluid and, and decentralized. And to the extent where the teams can't do that, you start to homogenize and, and create hierarchy where somebody at the top says what's meaningful and that co comes down, right? So you can, you can think of it like, um, there would be like good meritocracy and bad meritocracy then? Because good meritocracy would be the way in which competency is judged at that kind of uh, horizontal peer-to-peer -peer level. And bad, bad meritocracy would be people telling the organization what values are merit, meritous or not, yeah? Um, and, and the difference between those two, the way that you can use meritocracy to centralize value as opposed to decentralizing value, uh, I think that's teaching people to do those negotiation skills and to establish those boundaries themselves is what allows you to have judgment at the at the edge as opposed to judgment at the center and that, that i think that's really important okay well meritocracy for me is such a touchy subject mm -hmm. so uh, <laughs> even bringing it up here we could go on for another hour and and one of the things like going back to the laundry thing 
yeah. that's when uh, the meritocracy bit is there is um, the different parts of the infrastructure and the skills and the other things and the, you know, the privileges and all of that, um, the baggage that comes with, you know, measuring success. And, and, and what I liked about going back to the laundry and probably the toilets and the bidet conversations is by breaking these things down, um, we, we can start to see where the inadequacies in our judgments on people's, uh, and for me, for code contributions and, and things of that ilk. Um, break down and we, we kind of hide behind different versions of the conversations around meritocracies in order to rise up through organizations or get credit for efforts that we put in. Yep. I know um, Barbara just turned on her camera and she had a, a point and she was struggling a little bit with the conversation around um, meaning. So. Hi, Barbara. So, hi, Jabe. So, this is where I, when I'm dealing with these situations, this is where I, I have, an, uh, and let's use the laundry example again. So if I, for me, when I come from a perspective of understanding it, the whole system is important to me. Yep. Not just that, you know, for a professional laundry, it's about doing, doing it in the fastest, most cost effective fashion, yep. right? And for other people I know, it's just about clean clothes. Just, yep. I don't care. I don't care how much it costs. I don't care how you did it. And so reconciling or creating the boundary around those three perspectives within this, this system of laundry is, is where I'm struggling because I can't really think of a way to find the common ground necessarily. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Yep. So, I mean, you know, like uh, your your relationship with laundry and your laundromat's relationship with laundry would have to close at a meaningful level in order for you to continue to use that laundry facility. Does that right. make sense? So there's like yeah. ways in which they overlap. And yes, I, I think like the efficiency argument that you're pointing at is more about skillfulness than meaning uh, because mm -hmm. the laundry is trying to do the job that you expect them to do and that expectation is a form of meaningful creation of meaning right um and, and to the extent that you um you know to the extent like wh when i'm at home i wear the same pair of shorts for like a week and i don't care i because it doesn't have any meaning to me when i go to work i don't right because mm -hmm. i know that i have to show up wearing different clothes every day or people will go What's wrong with you, right? So, laundering and 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 social presentation of dress and all these things are related in a in a set of meanings, yeah. Um, and and I think the important part is the common ground is to say uh, we talked about this a little bit last time. I think we chatted. Uh, it's requisite coherence, where requisite mm -hmm. means minimal, right? It's not because the requisite coherence has to be balanced by requisite variety because it's the tension between the two that allows kind of like an exploration of, a, of the space by more people. Or another way of saying an exploration of space is it, 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 if you only have one way of making meaning, then everyone is forced into that way of being, yeah? As opposed to having multiple ways of being that are only loosely collected by common ground where common ground again means when I bring my laundry to the laundromat, I have an expectation of what the laundry will look like when it comes out. And to the extent that they produce that, then I, when we have an interpredictable relationship and I'm more likely to use them, yeah? Um, yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, Mark, and by the way, Mark used uh, ironing as a metaphor in his maturity mapping presentation. So you two should get together and give a complete laundry picture. <laughs> <laughs> We, uh -huh. we we like to do cooking, laundry. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, but I mean they're easy to understand. Uh, showering is a good one too. Uh, in that, like, um, how do you how did you learn to shower? How do you reproduce your showering? Like most people can't remember being taught. Like you know, we're taught to shower in school usually, um, but the material conditions of the shower really stabilize your relationship to it. Like if, if you have shampoo and soap and all these things those those like 
tell you what to do. I need to soap, I need to shampoo, I need to do these things. If those things weren't in there, you wouldn't necessarily do those other things. You wouldn't think to do them. And this is one of the reasons why it's really hard to destabilize and change some systems is because to the extent the social practice is private or is isolated in some way, um, like taking out trash, uh, showering, cooking, things like this, uh, there's there's less judgment, there's ju less judgment of the competence on it, and therefore it becomes more difficult to modify those behaviors. So from a sustainability perspective, the reason people study those things, uh, those particular practices, is because those are the practices, the, the, the everyday practice of the way of being in the world of a modern Western person is what is causing the system to be uns unsustainable. And it's not like, um, you know, one practice that needs to change. It's a bunch of them. And so that's really kind of interesting. And just one really quick last point around meaning, right? Uh, one of the things that comes out of sustainability practice and one of the reasons why you can't just change meaning that's shown by these studies is that if you, if you, if you convince uh, me to recycle, I, I do recycle, but if, you, if I didn't and you convinced me to, and you gave me a bunch of environmental reasons for why I should be recycling and I accepted them, um, and I started recycling, so you changed my behavior. The correlation between my behavior change around recycling and showering and laundering and electric use is non-existent. In other words, you can convince me that environmentalism is good, but you will have to convince me again to change each practice because the practices don't change by themselves just because meaning changes. This is just too easy to modify the practice to achieve this, the same meaning, basically. So uh, they're, they're uncorrelated. And so it's why I think like when you look at something like the Agile Manifesto, which is great, uh, but it's literally a set of values and principles, and you wonder why so many organizations have a hard time transforming to them, there's your answer. Because you can convince people that it is better to be agile, as in the way it's defined in the manifesto, and have everyone accept it and still not change their practices. So that brings up an interesting thing that you also talked about in the boundary practices segment of this conversation um, about social social spanning roles, uh, you know, because yep. we have things like agile coaches and, you know, dev, DevOps coaches and DevRel people in communities and the people who span those things and the importance of those, um, those roles um, and um, the other idea about the boundary practices stabilizing the system. Um, and I wonder if you can talk a little bit, I, I know we're going over time, so, and, and and we're fine with, I'm fine with that if you're fine with that and just cut me off um, when you need to go do something like walk the dog. But, um, <laughs> you know, whatever that is. But um, what, you know, what I see the role of like community development people like myself or an agile coach or, you know, the folk you guys up in the um, GTO office is, is you are the people who, um, it's not that you're um, have an, a, a higher level view of things, but we actually see what's going on in these different areas of practice. And um, I'm I'm kind of interested in um, these social technical practices and how they um, can be applied to change, help change um, regular practice, you know, technical yep. practices as well, or behavioral. I, I, I was thinking of them more in, in organizational behavior um, than practices, but they kind of interrelated. Yeah, so I, I think um, I'd love to come back and do it, to talk with you guys about social technical systems design because that's a whole another long set of theory that I think is really interesting and useful. But boundary spanning roles, I think, is one of the most important implications of it. Um, and boundary spanning is um, so the way that I usually describe it initially is just is, is pretty simply. Um, Agile coaches tend to work inside of teams, and they work to create interpredictability between between teams by making the teams do the same rituals and do do things the same way. Right? It's not necessarily best practice, but it is about kind of like everybody has a general shape 
that they're in and they all generally do the same thing. And then if you get to like, maybe you get to scaled agile safe stuff and then you have make big room planning and stuff like that all about, which is all about kind of predictability and conversations about being predictable and all that type of stuff. It's, it's, let's say I'm not a huge fan, but it's neither here nor there. Uh, if I were going to talk about a boundary spanning role, though, I would think of it as a coach that sat literally in between teams. Yep. And so the, the first thing to think about is that this often in an organization ends up being the manager because the manager is the person that connects the two teams together. Yeah. But the, of course, the problem is the power differential. It's just like you have you don't make your boss your scrum master. You don't you know, you don't make the boundary person uh your boss because they don't there's no way to kind of disarm your boss enough to have these difficult conversations so it, it is a coaching role that specifically sits in between teams a and b it specifically is there to modulate the boundary and, and to keep it flexible and negotiated so one of the ways to say that is this Often in organizations, the way that boundaries are negotiated is that the boss person creates a set of policies in order to keep people from coming into their office and harassing them about the interaction between conflicting teams. Yeah. So, OK, so we're going to have a policy about that now. And of course, you get the classic uh, wall of confusion policy wall problems going, right, which is that the relationship between the teams becomes highly transactional. You must perform this ritual with this outcome in order to transact with this other team, not in order to negotiate with them, but in order to satisfy their particular requirements. Yeah. So again, the result of this is things like what causes DevOps, which is developers create too much code, they break the operators, uh, uh, system that they've been using for years to deploy every six months by asking them to deploy every two days. The operators get all pissy because they get called all the time and the code that they're getting they think is crappy because it doesn't have any operational consistency to it. And so their lives are being ruined while the, while the developers are off having a party because they're releasing new features all the time. Yeah. So what do the operators do? The operators and the operators' bosses erect these huge policy walls that say you have to jump through 16 hoops in order to deploy, which slows the developers down. But that doesn't actually solve the problem. It just makes bigger and bigger piles of change that all of a sudden slosh through and cause huge amounts of problems uh, uh, every three months as opposed to small problems every couple of days. Now, what if instead of having that policy wall and that transactional relationship, you had a more reciprocal relationship where you had someone who was coaching the two sides to negotiate on practices and expectations and outcomes and with the recognition that all of those things probably need to not be defined up front, but in fact evolve over time because yeah. the materials and skills need to change in order to achieve the agreed on purposes that we agree on. And those things can't happen tomorrow just because we want them to. We have to actually practice the practices, right? So like one of the things I, I like to point out to people that, that like uh, is a great study is uh, the study of um, adult computer use in the United States. Um, and, and if you ask most people like, how long, especially people like us who have used computers, how long does it take to learn to use a computer? And I don't mean like program. I mean like open a browser and send an email. How long does it take to do that? And the answer is for a completely naive human who's never seen a computer before, it's about two years to become competent. And the reason is because like we look at all the visual metaphors on our screens like folders and trash cans and all that kind of stuff, and they have meaning to us. They have the, the material has a meaning and a skill associated with it. We can get, we understand it. But for someone who doesn't know what any of those metaphors mean, they can't even interact with the computer, right? They mm -hmm. can't work with it. And so you get like uh, in a lot of a lot of places, like people talk about like, well, we want to we want to make job uh, helping people find jobs easier. And one of the ways we're going to put a job board up, and we're going to give people access to a computer in a library. Well, they can only use the computer for a couple hours at a time. 
and um, there's nope. more people waiting, so they don't get enough practice time, so they never learn. And so everybody who uses computers all the time is just like, why can't they figure out how to use a computer? It's simple. Well, no, it's not simple. You're competent, and they're not competent. That's not a judgment on their ability to become competent. It, it is an expectation that you already have of them. It's even deeper than that. It, and I think this touches on the meaning piece of it. As I took my then 85-year-old grandmother to the library and just to get a book, right? And yep. there was a whole bank of computers. And this was, she's, uh, Ger she's long since passed, but she's German and all, you know, she loves orchids. And so I said, hey, let's sit down over here and let's go to the website as soon as I lost her, as soon as I said, for the orchid garden place we're going to go to in Florida next week. And I sat her down, and there's a keyboard attached to a terminal. And I said, okay, let me, and I typed in something on the keyboard, and the website came up. And she looked at me and said, how come it's not doing anything? Because she saw the terminal as a TV. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. She had no connection that the keyboard was attached to that terminal, right? So the meaning for her was so far away from the meaning. It wasn't even about trash cans or browsers or anything. It's like the actual physical thing that the computer was, wasn't even a concept in her mind. And it that was my first user experience, user design epiphany about, you know, what it really means to know nothing at all about the objects that we are so deeply um, embedded in our lives and devices that there are whole um, generations, cultures of people that have no experience of how the keyboard, which no longer even has a cord anymore to that, it's like a wireless thing or it's attached to your laptop, but it's like, it's just, and she just said, no, nah, I'm not even interested. If it doesn't move and where's the channel changer, whatever it was, but it was no, was the, the thing. So I, I think it was... It's a lot about meaning here and sharing the meaning. So, I think, um, you know, like another example of this, because like it's a material meaning thing without without a skill that goes along with it, which why so I gave my, I gave a relative of mine a computer. And the reason I gave her a computer was because her mother was from Edinburgh um, and she had sung a set of traditional folk songs that, this my, my my relative wanted to record and she thought it was important and her, and her mother had recently passed away she just really wanted to write down all these songs um before she forgot them um which i don't think she would have because she still sings all of them but anyway so we gave her the computer and we were like you know here it is and she clearly interpreted the computer as a typewriter because what happened was we came back a year later for christmas and she very proudly came out with a big pile of paper and said, I, I've transcribed all the songs and I, I think this is all of them. And it was a big, I mean, it was like a couple hundred pages, I think. Um, and I was like, great, can I have the files? She was like, what do you mean? I was like, well, you know, when you typed it, you saved each version of like, nope, she printed them because it was a typewriter. And then she turned the computer off and walked away. She had no idea that the, that there was a way of saving the text. Yeah. Um, and, and so it's it's you know when you you associate the physical materiality with some other thing and then you try to skillfully interpret it that way. I I, I like to say the same thing happens with like uh, machines, VMs, containers, mm -hmm. materially, naively people can be like, oh, those are the same thing. But if they do that, they literally don't understand the skill sets that are required to effectively use a container because a container is nothing like a machine mm -hmm. if you actually are using it skillfully. In fact, the whole point of the container is to make it as little like a machine as possible because that's the whole fucking point of it. I'm sorry. I didn't mean yeah. to swear. But anyway. <laughs> Yeah, uh, VMware, v VMs and cement boots. And um, <laughs> we'll have another conversation about that. But I, I think that there's like, there's so much we could talk about here. And, you know, I I, I do want to respect everybody's time and, and effort, but I definitely want to continue a conversation about um, like applying this to com the 
I guess I'm trying, what I'm trying to tell you is these community spanning, um, social spanning roles. Um, because I, one of the things as a community development person, I span um, product management, sales, marketing, open source projects, foundations, all of these things. So I'm in this, this I, I think, I believe one of those roles. Yep. But, um, and I think there are a lot of other people um, who are in roles that are similar. They might not be community focused, but um, how, um, like they're not empowered to do more than or to be listened to or to be coached. And so there's another challenge to tease out in there is, and I think what I like so much about this is it gives us that you're, you framed a very nice way for us to talk about it and to explore it with some of the other um, folks and explain what it is we do um, and how we can help, but also then getting management to recognize the people who are spanning these boundaries and empower them to have those conversations. Yeah. Um, and I think those, uh, maybe there's a whole, com another, uh, there's always lots of conversations with you, Jeb, but um, to figure out how we identify and empower those people um, and, you know, the, and then, then don't turn them into power crazy people. Um, yeah, so, yeah, so. Okay. You know, that, that's, that's the other, the edge of the, the, the sword is, you know, how, how you do this and, and, and do it well. And, you know, I think that another conversation about social technical practices oh. Um, and, oh boy, there was so much in this today. So I, I, I truly appreciate um, your time and effort. I can't wait to read the dissertation. I, yep. I don't think I've ever said that about anybody else's <laughs> dissertation. So, um, uh, and, and please, I think it's um, like How much said, longer do we have to wait, Jabe? <laughs> You, you never ask that question, never. <laughs> but I think one of the key things you, you, you talked about, um, change and everything, but the progressive accumulation of habits, right? And I want to continue this conversation with you because what I'm getting is a progressive accumulation of habits and understandings that are really helpful to me in terms of helping to transform communities within and outside of Red Hat. And um, boy, um, yeah, social spanning. Uh, there's a whole thing around the, the network analysis and when we identify the people who are spanning those networks, you know, the, the, I call them the connectors between projects, the people who are, are connected to multiple projects. How do we empower and train them to, you know, those are the, my targets for, you know, giving the skills to change um, practices or to create more successful practices. So there's a there's a lot in here. Yeah, I, th I think I have uh, some interesting things to say about that. So I'd be happy to come back and talk about that at some point, for sure. All right, definitely. So Barbara and everybody else, thank you very much for your comments and everything. Again, great stuff. And um, boy, this is, this is a challenge. I'm going to be watching this one again. I'll upload this to YouTube and I'll grab the slides from Jabe and tweet it out shortly. So um, thanks again, everybody, and do come back. Um, I'm not quite sure who we have on deck next week for Transformation Friday because I'm on vacation, but Thanks we will um, put somebody up there and um, make them talk to themselves. Cool. Thank right. you. Take care, guys.